It was getting late. The red rim of the sun was faintly visible over the line of fir trees that marked the edge of our property and the beginning of the woods. It was September now, the days just beginning to shorten in earnest, and in an hour it would be completely dark. Where was Catherine? I found her playing in the front yard. She was sitting cross-legged on the patio, arranging and rearranging the positions of several dolls in a large, white dollhouse. I recognized one of the dolls as her favorite, Beatrice. Beatrice was easy to spot because she was a little girl about Catherine's age. Unlike Catherine, she had blonde pigtails, a stainless pink and white checkered dress, and a perpetual smile. I'm going to school now, Catherine said, hopping Beatrice down the front steps of the dollhouse. See you later. I tapped Catherine on the arm. She flinched, then looked over her shoulder and scowled. Becca, don't scare me. Sorry, sorry, I said, half-heartedly hiding a smile. Mom and Dad will be home soon. They'll kill me if they find you out here in the dark. Five more minutes. No more minutes. But I can help move Beatrice into the living room. Catherine cradled the dolls. Beatrice and a couple others of lesser importance. And I picked up the dollhouse, and we marched inside, single file. The dollhouse was heavier than I expected. Much heavier. Up close, I could see that it was solid wood and lavishly constructed. With three floors, fully functional miniature furniture, and rugs cut from real wool. It looked expensive, and I realized I hadn't seen it before. Where'd you get this? I asked, setting the dollhouse on the living room floor. I don't remember this one. Catherine paused as if trying to determine the path that would land her in the least amount of trouble. Apparently, she didn't find one that suited her because she began inching toward the kitchen. Cat, I said, firmer. Did Mom and Dad get you the dollhouse? No. Well, who did? Catherine shot me an exasperated look. Then, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world, she said, The man in the pond gave it to me. What? She sighed. The man in the pond. He gives you one wish. That's what he said. One wish, and you can have whatever you want. Get it? And in one motion, she pivoted on her heel and strutted the rest of the way into the kitchen. Of course, I knew the pond she was talking about. It was the old stormwater retention basin, a hundred feet or so into the woods. Technically, Catherine was forbidden to go anywhere near it but telling mom and dad at this point wasn't worth the trouble. I made a mental note to remind her of the rule later. As for the man supposedly doling out dollhouses, it wasn't the lie, strange as it was, that stood out to me. I had heard far stranger from Catherine. Rather, it was how she lied. She was so casual, so blasé in her account of the man in the pond. 
Usually, she couldn't help but stare at her shoes or up at the ceiling during a fib. And even then, it only took one extra stern look to break her. And then, another thought occurred to me. There was no way Catherine could have carried the dollhouse outside by herself. It was nearly her size and heavy. Someone had to have helped her. I knew there were millions of reasonable explanations, all infinitely more plausible than Catherine's. But almost before I realized what I was doing, I grabbed a hoodie and flats and slipped out the front door. Just for a minute, I told myself. Just a quick look around. Just to confirm for my insane brain that everything was, in fact, okay. A few wane rays of sunlight still touched the yard, but they were fading fast. A slight breeze shook the trees. I walked to the edge of the lawn and found a gap in my mother's wall of ferns and rhododendrons, just large enough to squeeze through. The woods beyond it were dark already, the orange sky visible only in scattered patches through the interlocking fingers of fir trees. I took a deep breath and shouldered my way forward. Though the path was twisted and overgrown, I'd made the track dozens of times before. It only took a minute to reach the shore. The pond itself was more a waterlogged ditch than anything. Fifteen feet across, knee-deep at its deepest point. Standing there, alone, I had the urge to laugh at myself. What did I expect to find? Even in the dim light, I could see the pond was the same as it always was. Still algae green, smelling faintly of rotten eggs. And, of course, there was no one else around. No crazed hermit lurking in the shadows. The only living things I could see were the mosquitoes tracing near-suicidal ellipses above the water's surface. I sat down on a log and watched the mosquitoes dance for a while. It was surprisingly peaceful. If anyone's out there, I would take a wish about now, I muttered. The sound of my name obliterated any sense of tranquility, replacing it with a jolt of panic. The unrecognizable voice seemed to come from behind me. Or maybe it was in front? I couldn't place it. I whirled around, nearly tumbling off the log, but saw no one. I wanted to yell something sensible. Who's there? Or, if I was brave enough, show yourself! When the voice spoke again. It said. The voice was loud, but calm, as if trying to communicate something urgent but resisting the urge to yell. It was not identifiably male, as Catherine had indicated, but it was low, inhumanly low, approximately the pitch of a rock slide. Look into the water. I rose to my feet, preparing to run. 
I would run home and get Catherine and lock us both in our parents' bedroom and call the police. That was my plan. I didn't even get to step one, though, before I noticed something, moving several yards ahead of me. Lights. Hundreds of lights, just beneath the surface of the water. I peered down into the murk. The entire pond had filled with bluish-white orbs, each about the size of a quarter, darting this way and that like a school of bioluminescent tadpoles. Can you see? Yes, I mouthed. I couldn't take my eyes off the floating orbs. Good, said the voice, relaxing somewhat. Do you know why you're here? I shook my head. You're here to receive a wish. One wish. One wish, exactly. It can be anything you want. Money. Fame. Love. But it must be for you, and only for you. And once it's granted, it can never be undone. Do you understand? Yes. I understand, I said, more purposefully now. Hearing the terms of the deal seemed to help me regain my bearings, as much as possible anyway, given the circumstances. What will it be? Honestly, (laughs) I didn't know. It was hard to think of just one thing. There were so many aspects of myself, my life, I wanted to change. So many nagging, little inadequacies, and only this one opportunity to rectify them. Did I want better grades? Prettier clothes? The ability to be myself in front of strangers? Before I could reach a conclusion, however, the voice cut me off. Good, it said. No, look. All at once, the orbs began to accelerate. Faster and faster they swam, blurring into one another, until the entire pond emanated a continuous stream of bluish light. I took a step forward. There were shadows now in the center of the pond, a figure beginning to take shape. I took another step. It was a girl, a girl wreathed in blue and white. It was me. It was me, and it wasn't me. The girl in the pond had my skin. My eyes, my lips, my hair, my ears. But not, I gasped, my nose. Gone was the prominent, slightly hooked aquiline nose. My father referred to as my Robinson family inheritance. I hated it with a passion. The girl I gazed at now had the thin, vaguely elfin nose of a post-op celebrity. She was beautiful. Good. Said the voice. Now it was a question. Yes. (laughs) That is what I want. I stammered. Wait. There must be a balance. A new figure was beginning to take shape in the water. Another ghostly vision of a girl. 
I didn't recognize her at first. Then it clicked. It was someone I knew or used to know. Susan, my close friend in second grade, who'd moved away to Houston many years ago. I hadn't talked to her in ages, but the figure was unmistakably the teenage version of the girl I'd played typewriter with on the Discovery Elementary School playground, with one exception. She had a different nose. My nose. Now, do you understand? Asked the voice. I nodded. Do we have a deal? I'd like to say I hesitated. I didn't. We do. I said. And then, without a word of warning or goodbye, without even acknowledging the deal was done, the orbs of light vanished from the pond, dissolving into the water like sugar cubes, and as the lights faded, the ground around me was once again drawn into the shadow of the trees. And I knew knew, without having to test it, that the voice was gone and would not return. After my eyes adjusted, the first thing I noticed was how late it was. The sun had long since set, and the moon hung bright and low in the sky. I needed to get home before my parents grounded me until college. As I retraced my steps along the path, I noticed the second thing. My breathing had changed. I pressed my hands against my face and felt a modest bump where once my high arching nose bridge had been had actually worked. I didn't have my phone or any way to check on hand. I accelerated to a jog, then a sprint. Several near falls later, I cleared the path, crashing through the rhododendrons and into the front yard. Thankfully, my parents' cars weren't in the driveway. Forget being grounded. If the voice had kept its promise, I needed to think of an excuse for my sudden transformation. I sprinted into the house, past the living room, and into the bathroom, with its rectangular triple-door mirror. I left the light off at first, standing in the center of the sink, bracing myself for whatever I was about to see. Then, I flicked the switch, and the bathroom exploded in light. What I saw nearly stopped my heart. In the mirror was the face I'd seen minutes earlier in the pond. It was the face I'd imagined for myself in countless daydreams, struggled to create with makeup and outright fabricated a couple times in doctored Instagram posts. My new nose hung delicately from the center point between my eyes. Its slender bridge sloped upward at a precise 35 degree angle. Even as I stared at it, I couldn't believe the difference one feature could make. I felt like a new person. sang a voice from beyond the bathroom door. I froze. I'd forgotten about Catherine. It was way past her bedtime. Catherine was sitting on the living room floor, still completely engrossed in her games within that massive dollhouse. 
Luckily, she was facing the wall opposite me as I entered the room. Probably best to avoid looking at her directly, I thought. I didn't want to scare her. For a minute, I watched Catherine play hopscotch with Beatrice in one hand and another doll in the other, bouncing Beatrice up and down on the wood floor, counting one, two, three, four in Beatrice's imagined helium voice. I looked at Catherine, and I looked at Beatrice, and I looked at the dollhouse. And I felt a question forming on my lips. It was the question that should have been asked first thing when I re-entered the house but had been overlooked in my mad dash to the bathroom. My dawning comprehension of the situation seemed to grin at me like a demon. One, two, three, four... Cat, I said, looking over her shoulder at the immaculately painted rooms, the handcrafted furniture. What? She said. When you talk to the man in the pond... Yeah? When you asked for the dollhouse, I mean, did the man say anything else? Did he say he would trade you the dollhouse for something? No, said Catherine flatly. No? No. Really, Cat? I asked, my voice rising in pitch. You didn't have to make a trade? No, repeated Catherine, for the third time, still not looking up. I mean... I didn't wish for a dollhouse. I got a dollhouse too, but that wasn't my wish. I waited for her to continue. I wished for a family, for Beatrice. She was lonely and needed a family. To put her to bed and make her dinner and take her to school and- I didn't hear the rest of it. All my attention was fixed on the doll she was holding. The one opposite Beatrice, one of the two others I'd seen her playing with earlier but hadn't looked at closely. It was a middle-aged man, paunchier than your typical Ken doll. He had glasses, a flannel shirt, a neat beard, and... That nose. The same nose I had wiped from my face forever. Without hope of ever getting back. <laughs>